From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News. I'm Steve Dent, a reporter and broadcast production team member here at the Cronkite School. But I'm also an Iraq war veteran using my GI Bill benefits to further my journalism education. Tonight on Cronkite News, a special episode to honor our veterans, a compilation of reports from the past year on the issues that Arizona military families face and the inspiring stories of support for our veteran communities. Earlier today, President Obama announced the drawback of troops from Afghanistan will again be delayed. Cronkite News reporter Angie Schuster has the details of the president's plan to keep troops overseas. As the war in Afghanistan enters its 15th year, the complete removal of U.S. troops still seems a ways away. President Obama announced today that he is abandoning his original plan to withdraw nearly all troops from Afghanistan, stating that the Afghan military is just not ready to secure the country on their own yet. As Obama's second presidential term is coming to an end, the plan to remove U.S. troops from Afghanistan, what could have been his administration's legacy, has been extinguished. I've decided to maintain our current posture of 9,800 troops in Afghanistan through most of next year, 2016. Obama then plans to reduce troops to 5,500 by 2017, something that his original plan had called to be done by the end of this year. But maintaining our current posture through most of next year, rather than a more rapid drawdown, will allow us to sustain our efforts to train and assist Afghan forces as they grow stronger. If we're going to go in there, fight a war, we need to end it with the country in a stable position, and, and this will help. Lieutenant Colonel James Collison served active duty in the Air Force during the Vietnam War for five years and served in the Arizona Air National Guard for 22 years. I think that probably the average soldier <clears throat> is saying, oh, here we go again, but at the same time, they want to they do what's right, and they want to, to the extent we can win <laughs> over there, they want to be part of that. and. Uh, you know, they're, they're here to serve their country, and the country calls them to serve in Afghanistan for another two years or however long it is, then that's what they'll do. President Obama said that the bigger residual force of troops won't be in combat. They will instead focus on counterterrorism missions and advising Afghan security forces. In the broadcast center, Angie Schuster, Cronkite News. Another whistleblower from the Phoenix VA hospital is stepping forward and testifying before Congress today about the hospital's misdeeds. Cronkite News reporter Elizabeth Blackburn takes us inside the hearing room. When Brandon Coleman spoke out about the way the Department of Veterans Affairs was handling suicidal vets, he thought he was doing the right thing. He did not expect the response he got from administrators. I came forward because of the suicidal vets. I was uh, accused of threatening an employee when they said they couldn't fire, you know, when the director was told he couldn't fire me for, uh, for telling the truth um, on the news. Uh, so I was removed, or taken out of my position two weeks later. I have fought nonstop. Coleman was placed on administrative leave in February, shortly after speaking out on ABC 15, and wants the director to be held accountable for his actions. And so for and instances like mine for, you know, to have a, a director have a meeting to propose my removal after I came forward because suicidal veterans were, uh, you know, f freely walking out of the hospital is just wrong. So we need accountability. Directors like that need to be fired for breaking the law. And until that starts happening, um, whistleblowers are going to be afraid to talk. He was one of four VA whistleblowers whose testimony brought a sharp response from lawmakers like Senator John McCain, who said retaliation must stop. So we will do everything we can to hold them accountable. And what bothers us is that what happens to you is a strong disincentive for others to act with your courage. Coleman says it is a privilege to work with veterans, and now he just wants to get back to his job. So, and it, this is just the start. I won't stop until I'm back in a safe environment at my hospital, at the Phoenix VA Hospital, running my 52-week treatment program called Motivation for Change. In Washington, Elizabeth Blackburn, Cronkite News. When questioned by senators, VA officials at the hearing were not able to say how many people have been disciplined at the agency since the scandal first surfaced early last year. Along with a network of volunteers and supporters, grants final dreams for adults with a life-threatening illness. For one Arizona military family, the Dreams for Veterans program offered a trip of a lifetime to Washington, D.C. Cronkite News reporter Elizabeth Blackburn has their story. James and Sherry Malone may look like the typical D.C. tourists, but they are here for another reason, to fulfill a last wish. 
His dream was a trip here to Washington, D.C., and he just wanted to come bring us here, show us, you know, the monuments, show us the Declaration of Independence, you know, wanted to go to, you know, some of the museums. And Dreams for Veterans granted that wish. Dreams for Veterans had approved my father's dream of taking a trip to Washington, D.C. with our family. He was so excited to go. That's all he and I would talk about for that month. But Jim Malone never made it on the trip. He died the night before. But right up to the end, he just kept saying, you know, I, I can't believe that, you know, they're doing this for me and I'm so grateful. And he just really, it, it, it overwhelmed him. It overwhelmed him at the end how much kindness, you know, just the huge outpouring of love and kindness that he was getting. Dreams for Veterans invited the Malones to an event in D.C. to honor the veterans who were granted wishes. When he first passed, they offered us, you know, if you still want to go on the trip, go ahead. And we didn't want to. But it was really just an honor to be here and see the other veterans who had their dreams granted. Representative Matt Salmon presented them with a flag that flew over the Capitol in Jim's honor. The flag was flown for the Malone family in honor of James Malone. To honor the life of U.S. Navy veteran James Malone, your deep love of the country will never be forgotten. Thank you for your patriotism, selflessness, and brave service to your country. God bless you and thank you so much. Thank you. As they toured around D.C., they say this was the trip Jim would have wanted them to have. It, it's been really wonderful, and it's, um, it, it's felt like Jim's been with us today. You know, he's, um, it was a last gift from him um, that we got to do this. In Washington, D.C., Elizabeth Blackburn, Cronkite News. A Mesa man and war veteran spent 30 years living homeless before a new initiative helped him find housing. Cronkite News reporter Mitch Gasada has more about the city of Mesa's initiative to end homelessness among United States veterans. Larry Hutchison served in the Vietnam War, but when he came back to the United States, he had a whole new battle, homelessness. I spent 30 years on the streets of drugs and alcohol. But now Hutchison has been provided housing, thanks to Housing Mesa's heroes and the city of Phoenix working together to end veteran homelessness. Those who fought to protect our freedom abroad should never be left without a home when they return. That's the best thing that we can do as public servants is uh, pay respect to those who, who deserve it so much. Half a dozen congressmen spoke on Wednesday regarding the issue, including U.S. Senator John McCain, who also served in the Vietnam War. I'm so proud and grateful that today we do honor and welcome our veterans home. Hutchison, no longer homeless, said he compares life to a clock and looks forward to seeing time move forward in a positive way. Because if it goes backwards and then we remain into the past, We'll never handle the future, which is uh, counterclockwise, and clockwise is the way we need to go. Now, Mr. Hutchison is the first veteran to be helped in the city of Mesa with this initiative, but District 6 Council Member Kevin Thompson told me there's as many as 150 homeless veterans in the city of Mesa alone. He told me he wants to help all of them, just needs to take things one step at a time. Reporting for Mesa, Mitch Casada, Cronkite News. While congressional leaders vote on the Iran nuclear deal, supporters and critics have been rallying on the Hill to voice their opinions on the deal. Washington, D.C. reporter Adriana Barajas talked to an Arizona veteran who made the trip to the Capitol to voice her thoughts on the deal. That's right, that deal is being voted on as we speak with preliminary votes in both the House and the Senate this evening. It's the latest action on the debate that has been raging all week. $150 billion, which by the way, they get even if the deal isn't approved. As Congress and the Senate continue debating the Iran nuclear agreement, hundreds of people made their way to the Capitol this week to voice their opinions, including Arizona veteran Alana Brooke. So I came to DC as part of a group sponsored by VoteVets.org, and we're here to support the Iran deal. As a veteran who served in Afghanistan, Brooke believes this deal is the best path to peace in the Middle East. It should never be war as the first option. But opponents, including Senator John McCain, are concerned about the implications of this agreement. I think it's a very bad deal because I believe it puts the Iranians on the path to nuclear weapons in 10 years, a blink of an eye in the Middle East. Most of Congress agrees, and both the House and the Senate are likely to vote against this deal. 
but an expected veto from President Obama would let the deal take effect. As for Brooke, she is hopeful that in the upcoming weeks, this historic agreement between the six nations and Iran stand opposition. But I hope to see the kind of the tide of discussion turn towards the fact that, again, diplomacy first is what we want to do. The military option remains viable in the event Iran does not fulfill its obligations. But I think as a nation, we want to always press for peace and the, the diplomatic solution over war. The Arizona delegation continues to be split on the deal. Most state Republicans have come out against the deal, while most Democrats support it. With Congressman Ruben Gallego announcing his support today, live in Washington, D.C., Adriana Barajas, Cronkite News. If you've seen a lot of military hel helicopters lately around the Phoenix area, they're not drills, but are part of Marine Week. Nearly 800 Marines landed in the Phoenix area this week for the celebrations. Marines here in the Valley did their part by rolling up their sleeves to help clean University Park. They partnered with the City of Phoenix Parks and Recreation by planting a welcome garden in front of the entrance, giving benches and walls a fresh coat of paint and cleaned up around the park after the recent monsoon storms. It's good to work side by side, sharing some stories with them. Where are you from? What do you do? And uh, really just letting the community know that just not war fighters, you know, we're we're here, we're from a community somewhere in the country. Marine Week lasts until Sunday with events happening all over the valley for the public to attend. Some Arizonans are urging a day of service on a solemn anniversary. Local veterans and doctors traveled to Washington, D.C. this week to fight for the right to pursue medical marijuana research. Cronkite News reporter Nihal Christian caught up with an Arizona veteran who says medical marijuana helped him get his life back. Phoenix veteran Kevin Spence has struggled with chronic pain and post-traumatic stress disorder for years now. I was strung out on morphine. I'd lost every friend I had. I lost every family member I had. I couldn't hold a job. Uh, I, I, was, I became a hermit. I, I stayed inside my house for years. He said there's only one thing that truly alleviates his pain medical marijuana. I always had a tightness, you know, I was always real tight, you know, my neck, chest, all that stuff. You can, Severe uncomfort. you can just, yeah, it, it just, it's so uncomfortable. But when I smoked marijuana, that went away. That's why Spence joined dozens of other veterans in DC this week to lobby for marijuana research and acceptance. They were joined by Sue Sisley an Arizona doctor to support legislation like the CARES Act. It would permit veteran affairs doctors to prescribe medical marijuana for chronic conditions. Oh, it's the Senate bill. The CARE bill has a section in it that would eliminate these two barriers to marijuana research that we discussed. So if the CARE bill passes, that means that suddenly it would open up for scientists uh, the opportunity to finally embark on marijuana research and not be stymied all the time. She said if the government just let her conduct her research, she could prove marijuana's worth. If there are rigorous studies like ours allowed to be conducted, that's very dangerous because that might uncover data, objective data, that verifies that marijuana actually has merit as a medicine. For veterans like Spence, this research can't happen soon enough. He wants medical marijuana to touch other veterans' lives in the same way it's impacted his. My wife and daughter both said, I've got my husband back and I've got my dad back. And those two things meant more to me than anything in the world. In Washington, D.C., this is Nihal Krishan, Cronkite News. It is the often overlooked monument for what has been called the Forgotten War. But the Korean War Memorial, which celebrates its 20th year this summer, is still important to the veterans who fought in the conflict. Cronkite News reporter Andrew Romanoff caught up with a group from Arizona that visited the memorial this week. The planes are coming in and, and you look out and you see them coming. I can remember uh, shouting out, get that SB, uh, he's coming right at us. The Korean War Veterans Memorial turns 20 years old this summer. And when I got called back for the Korean War, I was probably 25. 
26, something like that. Now 90 years old, Prescott's Howard Bickerdyke gets to see the memorial for the first time. To see the engraving on, on the wall kind of starts your thinking. You can actually have empathy for what this is depicting. For Bickerdyke, it depicts his two years of naval service during the Korean War. And for its architect, designing the memorial was itself an emotional experience. I can't tell you how moving it is uh, for me as well as for them. I mean, I have uh, run into a couple of veterans who swear their face is on the wall. And it's the faces all throughout the memorial that some veterans say are the most moving. To see the, the, the statues, it just... Uh, just tugs at your heart like crazy. A squad out there in the field going through not knowing where they're going to be shot at or where it's going to come from or they're going to suddenly jump up and start firing away. Which makes it more than a tourist destination but a message to everyone who sees it. I hope that more people get to, to come and visit this place because it'll it'll make them realize that they too need to do something to make a contribution for what's going to come after. In Washington, Andrew Romanov, Cronkite News. The architect and some lawmakers are trying to add a glass wall of remembrance to the memorial. It would be inscribed with the names of every soldier who died in the Korean War. One U.S. Army veteran is doing his part to give back to veterans like himself right here in the valley, providing jobs to those in need by hiring them for his company. Cronkite News reporter Sidney Schumann spoke with the president and CEO about why he feels it is important to serve those who have served us. After serving in Iraq, now President and CEO Dwayne Baker suffered from PTSD and bipolar disorder. After trying to commit suicide, he says he had a life after death experience and has since committed himself to providing other veterans with a better experience than he had. Eight years ago on Thanksgiving morning, I hung myself with my family in the house and uh, my brother happened to come and find me and gave me CPR until the ambulance got there and they did what they did, brought me back to life. Dwayne Baker is a U.S. Army veteran and also an inventor. Two years ago, he started his own manufacturing company with a new life goal of giving back to other veterans, hoping to save them from the same hopeless feeling he experienced. I shouldn't be here, so since I'm here, I'm here for a reason. So I'm going to ride this thing until the wheels fall off, and I'm going to provide as many jobs as I can. Right now, four of Baker's 12 employees are veterans. The others are family members helping him out. But Baker says his goal is to one day expand his company from 12 to 12,000. These guys want jobs. They don't want handouts and they don't want excuses. They want jobs and that's what we're going to provide. Derek Papierski is also a U.S. Army veteran. We visited his first day on the job. After serving in Iraq, Papierski has had trouble finding and holding a steady job and has been unemployed the past six months. When you first come back, it's a little bit overwhelming, I guess, because you use a like robotic routine every day. There's a lot of stress that goes on in the military and when we come back we need companies to understand that and not penalize them. This job has not only provided Papierski with money to pay his rent but Baker serves as a role model showing what can be overcome with hard work. He inspired me and I think that's the reason why we connected because he's doing something that he loves and he started it like he said from the ground up from nothing and then him being a veteran and having his little struggles back and forth. I think what he saw in me was himself. And what he sees today is strength and success. I'm doing what I should do. Besides just hiring veterans, 5% of Baker's profits go to programs such as Disabled Veterans of America, Arizona Friends of Foster Children Foundation, and the Arizona Animal Welfare League. I'm Sydney Schumann, Cronkite News. Another decades-old-military episode is also in the news today, but this one is to honor the soldiers. Cronkite News reporter Sarah Donnell went to the burial of a World War II veteran from right here in Arizona. This day has been almost 71 years in the making for the 12 airmen, including a native of Clarkdale, Arizona, who disappeared on a mission against the Japanese during World War II. Today, their sacrifice was honored at Arlington National Cemetery. First Lieutenant Herbert V. Young Jr. was buried last year in Prescott. But today, Young and seven of the comrades who disappeared on that long-ago mission were honored again, 
their partial remains interred in a single casket. An army spokeswoman said it is common for crew members who died together to be honored together in this way, in addition to individual burials when possible. Twelve men went up on the B-24 Liberator, nicknamed Hot Garters, on April 10, 1944. Their target, a Japanese anti-aircraft site in New Guinea. Hot Garters never came back. Four of her crewmen were captured and died. The other eight were declared missing in 1949. But their remains were discovered in 2001, and in 2014, six of them were identified, including Young. All eight, including the two not officially identified, were given one last tribute today. Almost 71 years later, the Hot Garters crew is at last in its final resting place. The president landed in Phoenix on Friday to address the changes to improve treatment at the VA Medical Center. The results, a formation of a new committee focused on the improvement of veterans' care by the VA. Concrete News reporter Emma Lita Mejia spoke with one of the veterans who met with the president inside the VA. Upon arriving, the president quickly shook hands with a small greeting party before making his way over to the VA Medical Center in Central Phoenix. He was greeted by both protesters and supporters. Here at the VA, he met with a select group of individuals at a roundtable discussion. One of those few individuals present was Angel Juarez of the American Legion. Juarez is a department adjutant for the world's largest veteran service organization. In the couple hours that we were there, we discussed all of these things about trust, the relationship building that the Veterans, veterans Administration knows that they've got to go back and reconnect to the veterans and make sure that they know where, what, what their mission is, the hospital's mission is what they intend. Juarez said that the issues over long wait times and the apparent cover-up of those problems broke a bond between those the hospital serves. I think it's important that people who are not veterans know that it, it burned us because it, it's, it's hard to gain trust. However, Juarez believes the president's visit, along with continued meetings between VA administrators and veterans organizations, are the right steps in rebuilding that trust. The American Legion here in Phoenix, statewide, we feel like we are we're, we're, we're receiving the effort of the, the administration here to rebuild that trust. We, we, we think they're doing it. They're, they're trying, and that's big. Juarez is also hopeful that the new director of the Phoenix VA, Glenn Gribben, will continue to regularly invite him and other veterans to stakeholder meetings for input. In Phoenix, Imelda Mejia, Cronkite News. Cronkite News reporter Mackenzie Scott has been tracking the response to the president's visit. She joins us at the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Phoenix. Mackenzie? Although many were happy that President Barack Obama paid a visit to the VA hospital after he drove by it back in January, many said that this was long overdue. Uh, Congresswoman Kirsten Sinema said in a statement the president's visit to the Phoenix VA was long overdue. We need action, not more bureaucracy, to ensure all veterans get the care they've earned. While there have been some modest improvements, we must change the culture of the VA to put veterans first. Now, during the president's visit to the VA, he actually announced a new committee called the MyVA. Now, this committee will actually be responsible to um, improve delivery, um, to delivery of customer service and veterans' outcomes. Live from the VA Medical Center, Mackenzie Scott, Cronkite News. The city of Phoenix and history buffs got a blast from the past as an iconic World War II bomber touched down at Deer Valley Airport. Reporter Ryan Hale got a chance to step inside the cockpit and see the former staple of the U.S. Army Air Corps. Ryan? Megan, in this day and age, you'd step out into any airfield and you hear the roar of a jet engine. Those that attended Deer Valley Airport today heard a different sound. The chops of propellers filled the air as commemorative Air Force swung by Phoenix to remind folks of when behemoths like Fifi used to rule the skies. It's a giant plane with an unusual name. Meet the B-29 bomber named Fifi. The commemorative Air Force brought the Super Fortress to Deer Valley Airport in Phoenix. Awesome, powerful, strong memories, country. That's how Colonel Jeff Leinbaugh describes Fifi, and the memories with veterans are what stick with him. It was a really neat experience to see these guys that are 80 some odd years old, 85, 86 years old, 
and just to see the expression on their faces when they see the airplane and when they start reliving the memories in their mind of, of their times with the airplane. The B-29 was decommissioned around the late 1950s, just after the Korean War. There were more than 2,500 planes created and manufactured by three different companies. When these planes come into different cities, Linebaugh feels he is doing some good to those who served. To see the, the families of these guys and to get them to experience what their father or their uncle or their brother got to do and to have it see it firsthand, it's just a, it's a wonderful thing. Of the 22 B-29s in possession of the various museums, Fifi is the only B-29 still roaming the skies. She may not be as famous as the Enola Gay, but Colonel Mark Novak is still proud of their Fifi. Fifi's a one of a kind. I mean, there, there are very few airplanes you can go out there and say that it's one of a kind. So she's special. But every time I get in her, it's just, it's just an amazing thing that I, I, get, I get to fly the airplane. It comes down to remembering not just the history of the planes, but those who flew them. We had a 92-year-old lady come out, and she says, this is my area right here. She built, she put the rivets on between the engines. You know, and then so to hear her experience and her to be able to bring her family out, and, and share with them. Now taking a ride along the jet stream with Fifi might be something you'll remember forever, but you know what? So will your wallet. Tickets for a ride along CFA's B-29 range with prices from 559 to around 1600 bucks. Now that's one pricey piece of history. Live in downtown Phoenix, I'm Ryan Hill, Cronkite News. I would personally like to thank World War II veterans, America's greatest generation. I couldn't imagine storming the beach at Normandy. I would also like to thank Korean and Vietnam War vets who are treated much differently than I've been. The Vietnam veterans motto says, never again will one generation of veterans abandon another. Because of them, I will never forget the standing ovation we received after running the flag across the field at an Arizona Cardinals game. Thank you for joining us tonight. For top stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.